Welcome everyone to this event on uh, carbon negative battery production. What we try to do with this event is to show you how we can enable um, value chain for producing um, environmental friendly batteries and the potential of going all the way to carbon negative. We have some very exciting guests with us today. But first, I'll give the word to Frederick Helge, the founder of Bellona, who will share some initial thoughts on, on carbon negative and the future of uh, battery production. Floor is yours, Frederick. Thank you, Ivan. And uh, what we're going to present today is in a way putting all the work Bellona Foundation has done on uh, batteries since we bought our first electric car back in 1988. All the work we have done on carbon capture and storage since 94. All the work we do on uh, the battery production and to put all this together. And also what we do on biomass production. So when we started uh, the discussion on uh, electrification in uh, 88 with the first electric cars, we created a lot of good environment because people were laughing at us. Now it's quite uh, uh, sure that electrification will be an important part of the solution. And everywhere where we can do direct electrification, that's the best solution. Um, but also batteries has an environmental footprint. And to reduce that, we started back in, uh, in 2015 in Bologna to work on different kinds of battery chemistries. Uh, and then we started to work with a company called Graphen Batteries uh, because they work with sulfur batteries that doesn't need very much input of metals and also could reduce the use of lithium in the future. That's a long run, but what we found was different spin-offs that we could also make the existing battery technologies more efficient and more environment friendly. So when we're now going to present our carbon negative battery concept, that's uh, with the example of a battery company called Morrow that you will learn more about. That was a result of the work we did with graphene batteries and that we one and a half year ago got two other investors and where we know planning and building uh, for a 42 gigawatt hour production in the southern part of Norway. Uh, so I'm very proud of what we're doing. And I also is very keen to emphasize that what we are doing here is to enable a pathway to a carbon negative solution for, for batteries in the future. It depends on a lot of local circumstances. Do you have enough biomass sustainable available? Is it possible to store CO2 around the corner? And what kind of battery chemistry you use uh, and what kind of environment footprint that has? With us today, we will also learn more about pyrolysis technology, which is an important part of how we're going to solve this. So to be able to produce the future batteries, um, we have as a foundation a battery company called Beba that works together with the company Bo to enable solutions for the battery industry. And we have worked then with Morrow Batteries and their battery chemistry, and we'll ex explain the size and, and what kind of concept we need to develop to be able to to make them carbon negative in the future. So I stop there, it's late in the evening. Uh, many people are following us at uh, our YouTube channel. So this is also meant to be used for later use in education and so on. But we need now to build a network of suppliers and partners to realize this. And I always used to say that if, if you put really high target you get some spin-offs that is important. And maybe one of the most important things we have learned of this is that in the design of Morrow and also the location, uh, we enabling, as I say, a pathway 
towards a carbon negative battery company, but it's extremely important to avoid the blind track, to go one direction and then have to go all the way back again, because that's the most costly thing we can do. And um, with the, the figures and with the chemistry of Moreau, we're going to end up and presenting some examples. So I stop there and we'll be available for questions and discussions later. Thank you very much, Frederick. So that's exactly what we have done tonight. We have gathered different actors that can potentially contribute to this concept of making a carbon negative battery facility. So, but first we will invite uh, IA to the floor. We have with us the um, energy analysis Leonardo, who will go through some of the um, technological development and the scale up uh, that the IA sees necessary in their scenarios. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. We'll also continue the discussion later on in the week. But first, we are very happy to have you here and we'll find your slides, which are um, also available on the desktop. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just wait for the slides a second. <clears throat> Okay, excellent. Thank you all very much for having invited me here and uh, allowing me to sort of uh, show the, the IEA's uh, vision on this uh, key clean energy technologies that, that is uh, the, the, the battery. So, uh, first of all, I would like to. Okay. So uh, just a, a bit of context, the, um, most of the work on electric vehicles and, uh, and electric vehicles related technologies and the IEA is done within the um, Electric Vehicles Initiative, which is a multi-government um, sort of forum that uh, is sort of being put together to uh, cooperate on the adoption of electric, vehicle, uh, of electric vehicles in uh, uh, sort of in the markets. Uh, and there is the, the main political output of this initiative is the global uh, electric vehicle outlook but there are also specific campaigns such as the ev30 at 30 campaign uh, as well as other um, sort of city uh, city forums to discuss about uh, real ways to um, to enhance the adoption of electric mobility in different countries now i'm just going to take a step uh, back and start from what is the driver of, uh, of the need for um, for batteries which are electric vehicles if we go one slide next unless this doesn't work. So um, electric vehicles have had a tremendous growth over the past uh, decade. In 2020, they increased by 40% in an overall car market that decreased by around 15%. And in the world of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic, this is a, sort of a, is a remarkable uh, change. And now when we look at some of the most recent data for 2021, we see that in the first three quarters, uh, already you know, nearly twice as many EVs as those that have been sold last year have already uh, hit the road just in the first three quarters. So this, uh, this sort of tremendous exponential uh, increase on electric vehicles has actually meant that in the recent report that the IA um, released last week, the Tracking Clean Energy Progress, um, where we assess 40, over 40 technologies, uh, electric vehicles is one of the only two technologies that are on track uh, with our um, net zero by 2050 uh, scenario. Um, of course, this is not all, um, it's not all, all easy from here. For example, we can see that most of the, of the vehicles are sold in just three markets, the European one, the, the, the American one, and the Chinese, with not as much being done in, the, in developing countries. But of course, uh, action is there. Uh, we go to the next slide. Um, when we look towards the future, different scenarios have different implications for electric vehicles in the steps. So if we consider the, the policies that are already in place. We see uh, under 20% electric vehicle market share by 2030. If we take into consideration the uh, pledges that have been made uh, so far, we get to just under 30%. But that is, uh, is dwarfed by what is, um, is required if we want to be on track for the net zero scenario, which is uh, over 60% of electric vehicles. 
if we translate these numbers into um, into battery sort of production uh, targets, we see uh, a momentous increase in the steps. We get to uh, about under um, two terawatt hours, so 2,000 gigawatt hours, starting from a production volume right now, I mean, in 2020, of about 160. With the announced pledge scenario, we get to three terawatt hours, and then we get to the momentous 6.5 terawatt hours of uh, requirements in the net zero emission scenario. On a bright note, if uh, I don't know if you might be um, acquainted with the benchmark mineral uh, sort of tracking of all announced uh, battery uh, manufacturing plants, they have uh, about 4.1 terawatt hours of announced capacity that they've tracked in the market. So that is, is quite astounding and it puts it in a way closer to the net zero emission scenario than the, the stated policy scenario, which of course gives an indication of the ambition in this industry. We go to the next slide. Um, just, just quickly, it's, it's about scale up, but it's also about innovation, the, the, um, the challenge for the battery technology to have widespread electrification in developing countries in uh, um, heavy duty vehicle sectors, we need batteries that are more energy dense than the one we have now. And despite all of the improvement, we're not there yet. Um, so we need to have batteries that are scale up, that are ever more innovative and performant, and of course that are sustainable as is the, the topic of today's uh, discussion. We go on to the next slide. Um, the material implication of all of this battery demand are, uh, are enormous. We see that um, we have, would have, if we take all of the critical, or let's say the, the, yeah, the critical materials that are required for the energy transition, we see a five, over a five times, uh, so just about a five times percent increase in demand to 2050. And of this chunk of materials, batteries uh, and storage make up the, the vast majority. So this is, is clearly really, really important. There are huge increases in uh, demand for materials. There are smaller for common materials right now, such as copper or even nickel, nickel but for things such as lithium, the, the increase in demand goes up to over a hundred times what is currently, uh, what is currently produced. Go to the next slide here. I just would like to outline a, a piece of work that we've done in the critical materials report uh, that sort of puts different pieces together by looking at the life cycle of greenhouse gas emissions. If you click three times, please. Um, so the there's two uh, two conclusions here. The first one is that uh, clearly battery electric vehicles are better than in terms of greenhouse gas emissions uh, compared to conventional gasoline even if we take into account the emissions that are associated with battery production and with mineral extraction. That is sort of the, the first key point. The second uh, key point is what we see here in the sensitivity analysis that we're doing, is that uh, even, if we have, um, even if we have high emissions for the extraction of materials, this does not change the, the message. It's actually just 7% higher, the life cycle uh, greenhouse gas emissions, from uh, from these um, yeah sort of in, in this scenario. If you go to the next uh, slide, this is just of course and and on the, on the contrary, the if we have cleaner electricity, the the impact is larger. That is just because the fuel space emissions of cars are much higher than the production ones. However, this does not mean that uh, one should not tackle this issue. This is extremely important. One reason is the fact that the uh, carbon intensity of the extraction of many of these materials is much higher than that of uh, other bulk metals, mostly because of um, lower concentrations compared, for example, uh, iron ore. Um, and yes, and there are different trends. So we, we see that the fact that uh, we're going to use more of it, there's going to be lower ore concentration, meaning higher energy requirement for the extraction. And uh, but at the same time, the decarbonization of electricity and of the production technologies mean that the greenhouse gas emissions associated with production are going to decrease. And these things, uh, I mean, it, it, we'll have to see how these things all balance out. I hope this provides a good starting uh, point for this discussion. And thank you very much again. Definitely, Leonardo. Thank you very much. Uh, so what I take away among many things are we need a lot more batteries and we need to reduce our emissions at the same time. So it would be really cool if um, we could switch over to Zoom because we are so lucky today to have with us a 
battery manufacturing company called Moro Batteries, who is, I think, up to the challenge that Leonardo was presenting. We have with us Raul Fodeda, who is the co-founder and CTO of Moro Batteries. And uh, we are very much looking forward to uh, hear more about your plans on how to produce sustainable batteries. Thank you. The floor is yours. Hello, thank you. So first of all, can you hear me well out there? Very well, thank you. Good. So firstly, thanks for giving me the opportunity and giving Moro the opportunity to talk about what we are doing in Norway. And Nor uh, so I don't have slides, but I would like to walk you through our uh, plans. And uh, uh, so Moro is a company, a battery cell manufacturing company, which is uh, located in the south of the south of Norway. Uh, which is uh, we have the region we have now called the Battery Coast. And the company was uh, established uh, in the middle of last year. As Frederick said in the beginning that uh, the uh, graphene batteries, which was a company running in Norway for some time, was incorporated with a different company and together Moro came out of that partnership. Uh, what is something very important uh, to underline is that uh, for Moro, the reason of existence was to make... Uh, sustainable uh, battery cell production and not only sustainable but also very cost effective so uh, we had this vision from the very beginning that sustainability should not be associated with luxury and not everybody can uh, afford to buy a tesla and not everybody can fi fly an electrical plane so in the end the battery cells the electrical cars the the price has to go, go drop to drop significantly so that it becomes basically mainstream and with that in mind, uh, we kind of set out to, to start the project of Moro. And we had this two-fold strategy. One, we wanted to reduce the cost. And the second, we wanted to basically increase the sustainability of the, of the battery cells. And so if you would see, like, uh, I did not pick up the name, but of the gentleman who spoke before me, one of the main uh, kind of bottlenecks in the battery industry now is... Uh, is really the materials. So battery cells are the material game right now. There is a lot of carbon intensity in extraction of these materials. Many of these materials are in conflict areas. Many of these materials, the price fluctuates and many of the materials uh, uh, are, uh, yeah. So they basically create this uncertainty in the whole kind of, let's say, uh, expansion of the battery cell production. So we in Moro, we have... Uh, a very active strategy to how do we encounter that and uh, the first strategy is that we want to utilize technology uh, and by technology we want to focus on material technologies that can basically de-risk the, the risk of, of these materials. Uh, I want to point out in uh, specifically our, the work we are doing in uh, developing high manganese based batteries which is our gen 2 batteries this is the work we are doing together with a Danish company, a quite well-established Danish company called Halder Topso. And with this batteries, with the high manganese battery, you basically don't have any cobalt in the, in the battery cells, which is very problematic. You utilize far less nickel and lithium, both of which are becoming more and more scarce materials. And manganese is much, much easier found. Uh, and so that battery cells would be not only sustainable, but also much more cheaper to produce. We are also looking at uh, sodium ion batteries uh, for uh, storage solutions, as a which would also be a kind of a way to kind of decouple from the lithium uh, value chain, which would become more and more congested in the next decade. And of course, we have this work we are doing on sulfur since almost a decade, and sulfur being a petroleum waste product. If you are able to utilize the waste product from an industry and and use that as a major uh, raw material for battery cell production, that would be a real triumph. So we are working on all these different technologies and our thinking is how can we effectively use technologies to basically create uh, the batteries for tomorrow. Uh, yeah, moving on, one of the other things I like to touch upon is uh, the carbon negative uh, uh, kind of thinking we have. So a lot of people are talking about uh, getting carbon zero, but I totally agree with Frederick and the work Bellona is doing that carbon zero is not enough. We have to be carbon negative. Because, I mean, uh, 
how cool it would be that when you basically drive your car, you think you're actually pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere uh, in place of actually putting the CO2 in the atmosphere. And this may sound like a fantasy right now, but this is a vision towards which uh, I think Bellona is driving and also inspiring us to go. And I, I, I would like to spend a minute or two on explaining how can this be possible? Uh, so there are different ways to make it technologically possible, like uh, I like the example of biochar, something which they Bellona is uh, pioneering in Norway, and we are looking at. So biochar basically is uh, is forest is biomass which is which is basically absorbing uh, CO2 from the environment, and then uh, this biochar can be pyrolyzed further and graphitized to be used as a raw material in the battery production. So essentially what you're doing is utilizing uh, a material which has extracted CO2 out of the environment and using that material for the battery value chain. So this kind of work we are doing and this kind of work which several other groups are doing around the world, I think this is very key in basically enabling this transition from using this carbon intensive solutions to actually uh, going towards uh, a real green battery because uh, yeah, we don't want the solution to be worse than the problem itself. I think we have to be very aware of that, uh, of that thinking. Yeah, so we have been uh, trying our best to kind of uh, take the solutions forward, make commercially viable batteries at the same time, engage with partners uh, who, are, who are resonating with our solution, who are uh, willing to partner with us. And, uh, and I'm very glad to speak on this occasion and to take any questions on this topic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raul. So you already mentioned that uh, a key technology in this process is to use biogenic carbon instead of fossil carbon as one of the ingredients in a battery. We'll get back to that, how we can use that in practice. But I know that Raul is, um, doesn't have time to be with us all the way to the end of this session. So if there are any specific questions to Raul, please uh, raise your hand and we'll give you a mic, use the opportunity. Um, I can go first by asking you, Raul, what is, what is your plan on, on, on cobalt usage in batteries? Yeah, I mean, you know, all the mobile phones right now are only based on cobalt. And of course, uh, uh, there you have a very small batteries in it in the in the electrical cars are trying to reduce the amount of cobalt effectively all the main companies are all this nmc type materials have less and less cobalt but cobalt is, is super concentrated completely in uh, in congo and most of it is still produced by what you call artisanal cobalt which is essentially produced by children actually who are my, in working in these mines so i mean uh, it's very important uh, that uh, and you know, I don't think that uh, big companies would by default move away from that. So what they need to see is an actual alternative, an alternative product which gives them the same performance and has no cobalt in it. And this is exactly what, uh, what I was trying to mention before. We are trying to pioneer a technology uh, which is uh, basically going to uh, give the same performance as a, as a cobalt-based chemistry with, without having any cobalt inside it. And uh, there is a lot of progress made in this field in the last decade. And together with Halder Topso and some of our OEM partners, we believe that in the next few years, we will have cobalt-free cobalt batteries at very high performance level. So we're not, I mean, we have lithium iron phosphate batteries right now, which are also cobalt-free, but the performance is not as high as the cobalt-based batteries. So we are talking about batteries where you don't compromise at all on performance, but still have no cobalt inside it. And, and we are very passionate to bring that solution in the market. Thank you very much, Raul. Is there any uh, questions from the audience? Yes, yes. Here's the mic. Thank you. Uh, my field is the marine sciences, and I'm aware that um, the growth of, of your sector and, and the requirement for batteries is likely to mean uh, a need for us to go into deep sea mining, uh, which is very controversial because it comes at a great environmental cost as well as carbon cost. I was just interested to know, is this 
a conundrum your industry is conscious of and is actively trying to help us avoid or at least reduce the demand for deep sea mining? Uh, good question. Uh, and uh, uh, I mean, I have my personal view about it. And my personal view is that I personally am not in the favor of deep sea mining. I think uh, the ecosystems we have at the bottom of ocean are very fragile. Uh, a lot of uh, people like to say that uh, there are no kind of lifestyle, livestock there. There's nothing there. But I, I do not believe that. I think uh, it's, a, it's a very kind of a pure ecosystem. And I don't think we need to go there and mine on ocean beds. So, but, uh, but you have rightly said that a lot of people have looked at that as a solution. And we have to also recognize that uh, mining would happen, right? I mean, all these minerals would not fall from the sky. So, so this whole electrification we talk about very triumphantly, it has costs. And uh, I mean, we as a company, we have kind of dedicated ourselves to find uh, I, I'm primarily technologically to find solutions that can offer these uh, costs, these changes, uh, and that we don't basically kind of go again and create the new addictions. Because um, it's very easy then to find these different venues, you know, try to exploit the ocean bed, try to find, uh, you know, you know, create this huge mining pits in, uh, in different places. So I think electrification in general is a net good, but we have to be very conscious while we do it. Every step we take, every kind of option we take, there has to be a good public debate. Uh, why should, why are we doing it? What, what other alternatives are available? And uh, I think, yes, so some sort of regulation and debate is necessary. I hope I've answered your question to some extent. Thank you very much, Rahul, and thank you for joining us tonight. So I guess one of the questions that you have is where does pyrolysis and biomass come into this? And I'm very happy to invite Henrik to the floor. He is CEO of WOW, which is my favorite name of a company ever. So we'll switch to your slides on, on the screen. And um, glad to have you here. All and right, thanks a lot, guys. Very excited to hear. Thanks a lot, Raul. Thank you. Bye bye. Yep. We'll bring it up. And hello. Yeah. May start. Speaking about mining, I think the. Perhaps the future of mining will be at our landfills uh, in the future, uh, talking about how much resources that is left. Uh, I have a... If you go to the first slide. WOW is a, is a company that has been working in, uh, in many different types of industries. So, so why, why are we here? Why are we relevant uh, in, in the big picture around batteries? And some of these, some of these projects we have been working with might give you an explanation for that. Uh, wow is is a company that is uh, headquartered in Norway. Uh, we have subsidiaries in, in France, in the US. We have for many years been working in the cruise industry with waste management systems, helping that industry to eliminate sort of the charge overboard and to you know, get a circular economy around waste. Uh, today, every second cruise ship being delivered to the market is equipped with our technology. So this is the backbone of our, our business that has enabled us to move into new markets. Uh, lately, um, I would say that a, a common denominator uh, of, on, on these different applications is our, our pyrolysis system where we have over, over the years developed an effective technology that we can control retention time, we can control temperature, and that makes this technology um, attractive for many different types of applications. We are today, for example, working with waste valorization, meaning that we are converting a what today is a waste stream into a valuable commodity for other types of industries. A typical, uh, what, what we see sort of uh, a demand for today is, for example, European industry, high temperature industries that cannot electrify the processes. And with waste streams, we can convert sort of waste into a syngas, 
an intercarbon that replaces the, their today consumption of fossil. Uh, examples of that, we, we are working with, the, with Philip Morris International. They have production facilities around the world. They're headquartered in, in Switzerland. We have delivered sort of a pyrolysis system at their Neustadt facility, where we are using the waste streams generated in the production of, of cigarettes into a syngas that replaces the natural gas from the grid. And in that way, they're becoming carbon neutral. And then we are taking off that the biocarbon produced is, is sold for soil enrichment product. So it's, it's a way to, to, to take carbon out of the CO2 cycle and put it into the ground. Uh, we are working with, with uh, you know, Repsol, Metal. you can imagine these are, Metal is the world's largest steel producer. And they are, the, the, the metal industry today is, is emitting, uh, you know, seven, eight, nine percent of the world's annual CO2 uh, emissions. And that's because they, in their melting processes, they're adding carbon to extract the, 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 the oxygen as CO2. And, and our clients, for example, Elkem, that is today producing silicons for solar panels, are using a substantial amount of carbon, fossil-based, to extract oxygen. And of course, they are big emitters. And of course, what we are doing with them is to produce biocarbon from forestry waste, from demolition, in order to help them become carbon neutral. So, so it's, it's a way that we're deploying uh, advanced pyrolysis in a large industry scale. We are also working with, with, uh, with Repsol. They want to use urban waste uh, for their, their uh, infrastructure of, of refineries that today are, they're using natural gas. So they're looking at, you know, using, you know, enhanced circular economy to use the source, the urban waste as a source for energy production. And, and also to, to create, extract, uh, recycle sort of, uh, you know, uh, fuels from, from, from the plastic waste. So there's a lot of in interesting projects around there. I will also talk about wild green metals as a vehicle we have created to accelerate technology deployment. And, and I have a separate slide on that. We're also, of course, working with biomass uh, to, for soil enrichment, carbon capture and storage, because we're producing you know, stored stable carbon. We're working with waste management facilities that are, have typical green waste. They want to produce biochar to produce a, 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 car, you know, a product that they can sell. And there are, of course, we're getting at gas, natural you know, climate neutral gas that they can use in their facilities. And we are also working with, with chemical recycling of plastics and polymers. Plastics in, in France, we're working with Citeo, uh, is an, on a project to demonstrate high temperature pyrolysis of plastic waste, where we actually, at these high temperatures, we're creating sort of converting uh, plastics into methane. And we're cracking the methane into hydrogen and fixed carbon. And they're looking at sort of, you know, uh, let's say a, a very high valorization of plastic waste when you can produce, potentially you can produce graphite from, and, and from, from plastic waste to find a new model to, to, to get value of the, of the, of the plastic waste. And, and of course, also, uh, we're working here in, in UK with the, the largest tire recycler, uh, Murphy's Industries to produce recycled carbon black from, from, from end of life tires and, and, and these sort of recyclable fuels that the, the petrol industry can, can blend into their products. So, so, so we, are, we have been working with a, a lot of sort of industry applications. So we, we have vast experience to, to process different types of, of feedstock. And that's interesting in the concept of producing batteries where we could find uh, ways to recycle waste streams and put that into as, as sort of a, a biocarbon that could be further processed in artificial graphite in, in, in the battery anodes. Uh, why don't you take the... the uh... For us, it has been extremely important to, to scale up production because, you know, we need to be relevant for large industries. You can imagine we have Metal, we have Elkem, you know, companies that 
needs a lot of biocarbon. They need a lot of, of energy to replace their, their, their consumption of fossil. So for us, it's been important to, to, to scale up. We have a long experience in delivering a lot of technologies to industries. What we're doing now, we created in Norway a spin-off from WOW, where we, which is called WOW Green Metals, where we are producing large uh, amounts of biocarbon from uh, demolition wood, from waste wood, that the metallurgic industry in Norway will use as a, re you know, a, a renewable reducing agent. And, and, and of course, there's a lot of opportunities here to do the same type of model towards other types of industries. So that's, you know, coming in, we were coming in with a lot of experience on, on, on waste valorization, processing a lot of different types of waste feedstocks. And it's all about scaling up technology to become relevant for different types of industry. And we know that to be relevant for the battery industry, we need to produce a lot of biocarbon. And I would finish off with a, a, a very short uh, animation. Today, demolition wood and other waste streams from the forest industry are used as fuel for the number of workers to prove the speed. We see that there is an alternative to so replacing fossil material. We are building a plant where we pyrolyze these waste streams and produce biocarbon, which we use as a CO2 neutral reduction agent in production metals. Additionally, we produce CO2 neutral gas. And condensates that can be used as energy in place of fossil fuel. That's why we add additional value to biomass and recycle for a more circular economy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you. Cool. Glad you have on board. I'll try to use your paralysis technology in a battery company. Perfect. You want to see what it looks like? Okay, I'll see if the clicker works. Might be lucky today. Let's see. Yes. This is a sketch of how this could be done. So we include some elements here to try to, without cheating, get to carbon negative. And the two last sessions we had here were on the rules of carbon negative. If you spot anything that looks suspicious and not carbon negative, try to challenge us, okay? So we have the battery factory here. It needs a lot of raw materials, right? For the kettle, you need some lithium, manganese, and nickel, right? These have scope to emissions related to them. It costs some carbon to produce them. In this case, we have chosen the most, um, the raw materials with the least carbon footprint that, that we can find in, in public literature. And we get to, in this case, this is a very, very big factory. It's 42 gigawatt hours a year battery production, even though IAS, yeah, is slightly impressed by that. Okay, so if, we take all the scope two emissions of this, we get to 350,000 tons of CO2. So that's on the plus side of the emissions. Of course, we use renewable electricity to generate the factory. It needs a lot of electrical power, but it also needs a lot of heat. So by using solar cells, we can produce up to two terawatt hours a year of electricity, but it doesn't really give us the heat that we need or the carbon that we need. So I'll take you through the magical parts of how that could happen with pyrolysis. And then I'll try to zoom in. Okay, so went through this. Uh, yep. Yeah. I'll go to the next one. Are you, are you trying to make it look like I'm actually in power of the presentation? Okay. Okay, so we're here. For pyrolysis, Henrik told you that you can use a lot of different feedstocks. You could use plastic waste. That was in one of our prior scenarios. Uh, but then someone told us, well, you look like a waste incinerator now. It might not look so good in the long term. So 
in this scenario, we use zero waste for reparosis. We do use residual bio waste and quite a lot of it. In this case, 223 tons per year. That should be quite a lot. We have not looked into recycling of batteries yet. That would be next stage. If we can retrieve the raw materials from used batteries, that would reduce the footprint of the raw materials quite significantly. Right, so this is now a power uh, and also heat and carbon producing machine. Next one, please. So the biocarbon, we say that we can use about half of it to produce the graphite we needed for producing all those batteries. But the part that cannot be used is not waste, it's biocarbon. So I know Frederick is really excited if we can store it because that would also be carbon negative. And Henrik is really excited to see if we can use that for other purposes as well in the metal industry, for example. So this, whatever usage this would be, that would be a cool thing. It's not a waste product here, it's a byproduct. And the extra heat, 0 0.4 terawatt hours a year, that goes into the drying process in the battery factory. All right, next part. This is now biogenic CO2. You need to store that. That's the only way we can get carbon negative. So you have this amount, 223,000 tons per year of CO2 that you need to store. But we haven't generated all the heat we need yet. So on the next one, we go through a heat generating, generating plant and that could use biogas or natural gas. If you only use natural gas, you will only go carbon neutral. You need some bio in there. And this is the exact amount of biogas that you need for this whole system to end up in exactly zero. So if you tweak this to use more bio than um, natural gas, you will end up with carbon negative. So we try to not use ridiculous amount of, of um, biological waste. We try to balance like different scenarios, but without cheating, making a whole battery manufacturing plant carbon negative. Meaning you should be able to, if you buy these batteries or run on these batteries, there will be less CO2 in the atmosphere. That's what we're trying not to cheat on doing. Yeah, that's the sketch. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments to uh, any of the speakers? Yeah. Brilliant. Here you go. Yeah, I've got one for you. Um, I'm willing to believe you've crunched your numbers on the carbon correctly. What I'm wondering is whether you've crunched the numbers financially. Are you going to be able to convince shareholders to invest in this? Hopefully, if we see that the financial appetite for carbon negative solutions is real, then for sure. So the extra cost in this sketch would be the storage of CO2, which it's pretty easy to expect what that cost will be. That would be the add-on cost. What would be reduced cost is if we can build us this uh, renewable electricity generation ourselves. So it wouldn't be ridiculously expensive related to not using biogenic carbon in the process, but definitely it would be more expensive. Yeah? Thank you, just thank you. Cool, cool, cool. Any other questions? Leonardo. Thank you. I have a question on the, the paralysis technology more in general, because I'm, I'm not an expert on this. The um, Could like lignocellulosic biomass also be used as a feedstock or does it have to be waste streamed? Could one use forest products, for example? Thanks, Ruth. Anyone want to share, share ideas on it? I would say that, that to use the the um, the residue, the, the cellulosic uh, chips, you know, like that is of course 
is of course uh, very good. But it, of course, it's, it's also a question of whether you want to try to, because uh, biomass will always be a scarce source. Um, and, and very often when you talk about these initiatives, you're met with sort of, yeah, but is it enough biomass available for it? But of course, it's the way we see it, for example, in Norway, uh, a demolition wood, uh, it's a million tons. I mean, we are 5.8 million in Norway. Demolition wood is 1 million tons a year. That is sort of just burned. Uh, and, and there are sort of vast amount of, of, of waste streams that comes from the you know, sustainable forestry management that are, for example, directed in, 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 in towards fuels or energy. Uh, that towards processes that today could be electrified. Well, you can, it, it more deserves to be used towards industrial processes that cannot be electrified. And of course, advanced biocarbon products such as this. Because of course, this is, where do we use the right kind of biomass? Or as Shakespeare would have said, it, how to be or not to be. Um, but I think it's important that we think that when we do our life cycle analysis, this is a much, much better use of biomass than, for example, biofuel. And also, if you could in the future supply, uh, for example, aluminium melted with biochar, it's possible to do carbon capture and storage. You also enable that part of the second scope to be carbon negative. I think also for silicium and also maybe for nickel production, that will be an option in the future. But we, parallel to this, work a lot with new ways of producing biomass, uh, especially then with seawater. I hope that we can use what we do with, we are now the biggest producer of seaweed in Norway. Maybe that will be a source in the future. And we have this Sahara Forest Project with restorative growth. And of course, yes, we need the big companies to come in and say, okay, we can order aluminum to our car production. We start to plan now, and in 10 years time, we will have enough biomass to go carbon negative. So there is, uh, from our perspective, a, a clever way of using the biomass into the pyrolysis technology and produce biochar and syngas. It could also be that, for example, syngas could be a good way of uh, implementing also hydrogen to, to, to tweak on the energy density. This is where we're going to, to do more, more work in the future. Uh, plastic could be an energy source into this. Uh, it could also happen that we could use this kind of uh, technology to, to produce uh, carbon black that could be used into the battery industry and so on. So we have created, in my opinion, a scope where we, where we have several solutions that we have to explore. But we have not done this if we didn't put in a lot of work, which is one of the really big crucial issues. Besides getting deployed carbon capture and storage, we need new ways of producing biomass and we are working very actively on that. A, a comment, uh, you, you talked about sort of what, what's, the, what's, the, uh, what's the price, what's the cost of this? Uh, I, the way we, we're out there in, in many different types of industries. And I would say that I'm, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic because the industry is moving. Because what industry sees today is a risk of their operations. It means that there's a, it's a question of license to operate for many types of industries. You know, without any, you know, today a political consensus on carbon pricing, industry is moving because they know that that price will go high. And, and thirdly, uh, what the industry is, 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 is seeing now, and that plays out very nicely in Europe, is the new taxonomy. Industry gets access to capital. They get access to capital at a lower cost. So we see companies such as Philip Morris, such as ArcelorMittal, such as Repsol, are moving. They're not sitting there waiting for legislations or waiting for polit political consensus. So, you know, I, I just want to 
to highlight that the industry is today moving because not on their cost today, but on their, the risk they see on increased costs going forward. And that's, it has to, you know, the day that the, the cost of the actual cost of emission is reflected in a sort of a CO2 tax, that's, that's I think, will be an advantage to those industries that have already beginning, beginning to move. It was a question about cost. And of course, Moro batteries is very, very lucky because they have a lot of access to waste biomass in close area. There is a lot of surplus of hydropower. We plan now to build a 200 megawatt solar plant. Starts to be very reasonable to do. But a couple of hours north, the first carbon capture and storage facility on the cement factory of Heidelberg will be. And the harbor of Moro is just by. So the ship that is going out to the Norwegian public funded CO2 storage is just passing by us. So we don't have to, to make all that infrastructure all over again. We can hook up on the new infrastructure the Norwegian government uh, builds. And this is why I think also Moro is in that aspect placed to be the first uh, carbon negative factory in the world because we have all these uh, circumstances around. Thank you all for coming. Hope you enjoyed it. Hang around to talk one on one if you like to. Thank you so much for your attention and to all the panelists. Have a great evening and a great cup one. See you later.